Welcome back to Logic 101, I'm William Spaniel, and today we're doing something new. We're going to have some proof practice. I'm going to be looking at a problem I have never seen before. I basically found a problem set online with a lot of proof questions on it, and so I'm going to be going through this problem set and doing the problems live for the first time. That way you can see how this process works rather than me simply regurgitating an answer I had already figured out previously. This is a good so you can see that a lot of these proofs are simply trial and error and you keep going and trying to do something until it doesn't work and if it doesn't work you try something else and you keep repeating this process until finally something sticks for you and you can actually get the conclusion that you want to get. So let's go ahead and look at the first problem. I've gone ahead and for the interest of time written these out. So the premise number one is not P implies N and O. Premise number two is N implies P, and premise number three is O implies not P, and we're trying to conclude M. So now would be a good time to pause the lecture if you want to try this out on your own, and otherwise I'm going to go ahead and try to solve this. So the first thing I always do when I look at a proof is to see what the conclusion is that we're going after, right? That's the target we're trying to meet and also to see how that conclusion relates to the premises. So the, in this case, the conclusion is actually very simple. We're just trying to prove a simple statement M. So I wanna see in the premises, does M appear anywhere? And in fact, it does. It appears in line number one, not M implies N and O. The tricky thing here though, is that we have the negation of the conclusion rather than just the conclusion. It would be really nice if perhaps we had an M there by itself, and then we could figure out how to get that. But we're going to have to do something a little bit differently, I suppose, because we have a negation there. So my first thought here is to try a proof by contradiction. And the reason I think that that would be a good idea is as follows. We can assume that the negation of the conclusion, M, is true. And if we do that, then using modus ponens on line one, we'll have access to both N and O. That's a conjunction, they're both true, and that will give us a lot more to work with. So why don't we write that down and then see from there if that will buy us anything. So what do we have? We have line four as, let's indent this a little bit. We have uh, not M, and this is going to be an assumption for proof by contradiction, and hopefully this is going to have enough space. Yes, okay. So we have an assumption for a proof by contradiction, and then very quickly we get N and O as true, and that is, oops, let's get this capitalization right, and that is going to be true because lines one and four allow, uh, allow us to unlock that with modus ponens. Good, okay, and now what? So we have N, as, N and O as both being true, uh, all right, so we have on lines two and three, we could apply modus ponens again, it looks like, as long as we can separate out those N, N's and O's, and we can do that very easily because we can simplify, right? Simplification allows us to eliminate the conjunction and have these statements one by one. So line six, we have through line five, simplification, 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 there we go. It's hard to type and spell and talk at the same time. And why don't we go ahead and just get that O by itself as well? Because it, it appears that we're going to need that later as well. So that's through line five simplification as well. All right, cool. All right, so now we have these simple statements to work with, N and O, and we can see very clearly on lines two and three, we can apply modus ponens using both of those pieces of information, and you can see where this is going to play out, I think, from here, because we're going to have a P and a not P, and that will allow us to get the conclusion that we were looking for, or rather, rather, the contradiction we were looking for. So if we have lines two and six, we have modus ponens there, and we get P. Two and six modus ponens. And then on three and seven, we can do modus ponens once again and get not P. There we go. And that's uh, what I say, three and seven 
modus ponens. And then where are we now? Well, we have the contradiction that we were looking for. We have a P and a not P. We just need to conjoin them. So we have, notice I'm, I'm still indenting, right? We're doing a proof by contradiction. So I started out with that indentation and I'm keeping consistent with the indentation until we finish the proof by contradiction, which is going to be right now because that is an explicit contradiction, right? Both P and not P can't possibly be true simultaneously, but we're doing this with a conjunction introduction. Beautiful. And that wraps up our contradiction, our proof by contradiction, and so we know that the antecedent, or rather the uh, the assumption for the proof by contradiction is not right. We uh, can therefore conclude M, and we're done. Hey, look at that. That was pretty simple. Whoops. Wrong slide. Go back a slide. One second here. All right, so we're done with the proof. This is excellent. We used a proof by contradiction to arrive at an explicit, explicit contradiction, and we're good to go. This is it. That's the end of it. So to wrap up that last line, we have to write, what is this? We uh, have lines four through 10, and this is proof by contradiction. And if we want to be really fun about it, we can write QED. We are done. That's the end of the proof. Congratulations to us. We're good to go. All right, so that is one proof that we have just done, and we're going to do a few more of these together. And I hope you find this useful, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.